So I wish I were Manish, but I'm not. So uh, I'm talking about something completely different from the other speakers, whereas the other speakers were reporting about success, yeah, about success stories because they are from business. I'm today. Today I'm more from research, and in business, if you are uh, dissatisfied for too long, you are out of business. And in research, it's the other way around. Yeah, if you are satisfied for too long, you are out of business. So I will talk about problems instead of solutions. So although there's one slide on on success stories, but only one. Yeah, all the rest will be about problems. So one. Uh, so clearly, there has been success for machine translation. Yeah, there are. And I picked now four examples that I'm in, in one way personally directly or indirectly connected with. There are now free online translation services that were mentioned a couple of times today, and they are great help. They help many people in, in, in the whole world. They are needed. There are also in-house online translation services like, for instance, one that was mentioned today already, men, uh, used by the European Commission and other European institutions done in actually where many of the components were done in projects uh, that we did yeah, in our projects and our research projects and now now it's in existence yeah they are serving every day or for instance at vw volkswagen yeah there is an online in-house translation service in heavy use every day that was that is running with a rule-based machine translation system that i had the pleasure to work on in the late 70s as a student so, but today it's there. It's success. Yeah, it's success story. It's 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 doing its work every day, and we heard today already about Catalan to Spanish, yeah, or Spanish to Catalan newspaper translation. Every night, newspapers are translated with a high success rate, and it works. Yeah, again, one of the system that does it is a system I had the pleasure to work on in the early 80s uh, as a student. So, nevertheless, it's success uh, or specialized VW user manual translation that we did recently, and it worked. Yeah, it worked because it was very specialized text. But then, actually, if you move on, when it comes to high quality outbound translation, MT has not even scratched the surface yet. Human translation business is growing by more than 10% every year, and MT is not scratching the surface. It's not taking away anything of that, really. Uh, maybe slowing down the growth a little bit, yeah, to just 11%. So the remaining uh, barrier for machine translation still is quality, of course. And if you go back to these examples, then you see, I will come back to that. The online translation is not perfect, cannot be used outbound, but it serves some purpose. The in-house translation services, the same thing, cannot be used for publication. The newspaper translation, it's between closely related languages. It gets 75% right between Spanish and Catalan, but between Spanish and, huh? so, yeah, or oh, higher now, higher now, yeah, yeah, higher, maybe higher. I, I heard the last numbers I heard from the people doing this from Spanish to Catalan in the newspaper texts are 75 without post editing, 75% of sentences without any post editing. So, so that's closely related languages. If you move uh, to other languages like, I don't know, uh, uh, just German, you just have to go to German, and then it drops down completely. Yeah? Or specialized languages. But in general, it does not work yet. And there's an interesting observation. So more than 90% of machine translation research has concentrated in the last decades on this overview, on the GIST translation, just like Google, yeah? all running behind Google in a way. So the reasons is the funding sources, DARPA and others, they like this. Yeah, they need it for inbound translation, for intelligence services, for military, for all kinds of purposes. Um, there, there, there you can make fast progress and you can conquer new applications. So it's pretty clear why you want to do that. So, but nearly all existing translation markets where people are paying money to human translators are outbound translation markets in which you need high quality. So there's a lack of very systematic research on quality obstacles and on shared quality metrics for human translation and machine translation. It simply doesn't exist. Yeah, so. so if we now would go to a different analytical approach and first take, take a part and see where do the Bleu score increases come from year by year, then we can prove now quantitatively that actually they come from 
getting the very bad stuff a little better. So if you, if you take all of your machine translations and you order them and you say one part is good enough for a given purpose, yeah, outbound, another one is almost good enough with a few editing steps you can make it good, and the last one is not usable for outbound purposes. Yeah? So uh, usually a translator would re redo it from scratch. So then, and let's call them the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so then you see that depending on the, on the language and depending on the problem, the good are, can be as low as 5% and they can be, as in the Catalan to Spanish cases, maybe 70 to 80%, yeah, so, so get very high, uh, of the ones that you don't have to touch anymore. Then there's the stuff in the middle and then there's the ugly stuff. But in general, the ugly stuff is bigger. And in general, the good enough cases, take any you know, of your favorite translations and take any uh, translation pair that may not be Spanish to Catalan or Spanish to English or so, take any one of the other ones. Then you see right now, and if you take the increases, yeah, we, we looked at it and, and measured it, if you take the increases in blur score, they are gained on the red part. And that's very good for, for companies like Google because it means there's maybe one sentence more that gets understood at least a little bit. So for this purpose, it's exactly the right type of research. Yeah? But if we take now apart the research and we look at different, uh, at, at different parts of research right now, people try it very, very much with the same tool, just improving the statistical translation yeah? the, uh, to conquer all, all of these things. But if you take them apart, then you see that it's not exactly the same methods that you should use for all of the individual parts. So for instance, in the very good part, there's the need to recognize the truly good, because even if you are conservatively only catching, let's say, 10% that are really good, immediately you have saved 10% of translation costs. Yeah? So if you can do that. And then there is this part that now research should really and is starting to concentrate on, namely, how to move the ones that are almost good to the very good yeah? and look really what are the obstacles there. Not look at the very, very bad that have 10 mistakes in that interact and that you cannot fix anyway. And then there's, of course, many projects now helping the translators to improve the bad, the bad sentences like computer-assisted machine translation, uh, better post-editing, uh, environments, some of these things were mentioned. And then is the work on the ugly that is very, very important, especially for language pairs that don't translate that well and people in the world that cannot, otherwise cannot read certain, uh, have no access to certain types of uh, translation. So this is, the, this is uh, kind of the, the view that we are having on the, on the field and on the development now. And now let me see how we are trying to approach and make sure that this may really fly, that the researchers are gathering behind it and that we can make a push in that area. So, one of the instruments we had is a network of excellence with 60 research centers in 34 countries uh, called MetaNet. Many of you are members or are attached to that. And around MetaNet, there's a wider alliance for multilingual Europe with 638 members organi or organizations in 47 countries. So, and there was a vision process in which this kind of machinery uh, staged a process developing in line with the preparation of a new framework program, of a new long-term research program of the European Union, a vision, what can we do until 2020? So, and we started by looking at the state of European languages, not all of them, but 31 languages, uh, in the digital age. What's there in technological pro uh, support and so on. And these things are published. Those are the language white papers. You can all access them on the web. Yeah? So, so they are all published on these 31 languages and others are under preparation. And then another big thing that was done by MetaNet that I won't have time to go into was to install, to create, uh, um, uh, actually Stelios Piperides, who was heading this part, is here today, uh, to, uh, to create an infrastructure for resource sharing of a form that doesn't, uh, hasn't existed yet. And that's in existence now, so that's also very nice. And then we formulated a strategic research agenda for multilingual Europe, and that's what I'm going to talk about now next. So it's a vision with a plan, and it had more than 200 contributors. There was the Meta Technology Council with people in which 
the large international companies were represented and lots of other companies, about 60% companies, 40% research. And the drafts were discussed at 83 conferences and workshops, so it was a big, big affair. Everything in Europe, you know, that when we make decisions in Europe, yeah, it takes a long, long time and many. So every decision is very, exp I wish we had all this money for research. So, but uh, it, it doesn't work that way. We believe in democracy. So it's all bottom up, and the pre-final draft was, and we have it now out. It's now out in the, in, in the, in the you, everybody can access it on the, um, MetaNet website. And what does this strategic research agenda do? It sets the stage and describes the European situation, the needs, and the LT research industry discusses the state of IT, has a technology vision, and selects and specifies priority themes. And it suggests a model for speeding up innovation. Uh, I hope I have the time to get into this. I still have eight minutes. Right? No. Eight minutes. And um, also outlines proposals for organizations of research. So in deciding priority themes, we had to look at the European society needs, and European society is in multilingual, so that's clear, and take themes that support technology progress, and also try to go for solutions from which European industry will benefit. Because let's face it, there are certain areas also in hardware or so, in which European industry doesn't have much of a chance right now, maybe in the long run, but not right now. And so that would concentrate on some areas where we have a lively European industry. So three priority themes I will briefly mention. One that I will go into briefly is the translingual cloud. Yeah? So a, a big translation cloud or a cloud of clouds here, yeah? so that we saw them today out there too. So that understands everything, everywhere, every time. The second one is called social intelligence or e-participation, technologies for e-participation and better decisions. And the third one is socially aware interactive assistance. So kind of the, the theory that learns and goes, yeah, is socially, uh, emotionally aware and so on. So the super theory. So, and these things are interconnected in a way because actually the social intelligence, yeah, for instance, enabling, enabling a social change dialogue across language boundaries, that needs to be translingual and it probably also needs to have a speech part. And so also the speech assistant needs to be multilingual in a way. And so these things interact in many ways and there's in the middle quite a bit of shared technology because right now, if you take, for instance, if you have a very good parser, yeah, if you take, for instance, a Google parser of the New York group, it's used by the machine translation people, it's, called, it's used by query uh, processing, it's used by the people who bring in knowledge, who uh, enhance the knowledge graph, it's used all over the place. So there's the space technology in the center. So now let me say a few words on this translingual cloud. What is it? Um, it's a network, or what will it be if, 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 if it will be worked out? Yeah? What can it be? It can be a network of generic and special purpose services combining automatic translation, language checking, post editing, plus also including human creativity and quality assurance, because we don't believe that everything will be doable by machine. Yeah? So, and it may be free for small volume use and for maybe high volume baseline quality, like we have it already, and there are many business opportunity we claim for a wide range of services, of specialized services. So and there's a systematic concentration in that research that we propose on quality barriers. So one of the things that we need to do, and actually we will have a workshop to, uh, the day after tomorrow on that, is a multidimensional quality assessment model that is shared by human and machine translation that we are working out together with the language service provider industry right now. And, and also a, a, a very important part is significantly improved automatic quality estimation. So Lucia Spezia, who is mainly working on that, uh, is not here today, but uh, she is at the Taos workshop at the same time reporting on that work there. And also 
we want to include translation professionals and enterprises in the entire research and innovation process. And we have already started doing that. So in many of the projects, also in one project that I will mention, the LSPs are really part from the beginning on. And some more ingredients, and those are important maybe for some others of you who work on ideas like the vision of the semantic web or uh, linked open data. Um, I hope I can come to that in, on, I have one or two slides on that. It's a semantic translation paradigm that's slowly developing, even in a statistical machine translation environment. Yeah? So it's coming up now, it's, a, it's getting uh, rather big, and I may be able to say a few words. Then also the exploitation of strong monolingual analysis, like for instance these parsers, yeah, like the parser that I mentioned, and parsers uh, in pre-processing and morphological processing for translation, and also modular combinations of specialized analysis, generation, and transfer models. So, and then the, now, now an interesting thing is that what, what I'm saying now next is actually something that not necessarily is the translingual cloud, but in addition, the strategic research agenda proposes that was demanded by European industry, language technology industry, is a platform that these companies that are too small to build their own platform and offer their stuff, a platform for, this, for services that they can provide in the area of language technology, not restricted to translation. So, but now you can take, of course, the service platform together and merge it with the translation-related things, and then you get out these nice fields that the European citizens will be able to hook into or use many services that are not clearly multilingual yet in their own languages. So let me finally come to a, a, one project that is more like a pilot project going in the direction of quality research. We call it QT Launchpad quality translation launchpad because that project has the mandate from the European Commission to pre prepare something bigger, uh, to prepare something larger. The support action has to prepare the grounds for a new type of collaborative MT research dedicated to overcoming existing quality barriers. And to this end, there are four things that are done by this project. Assemble and provide needed data and tools including corpora, test suites, and so on. The second is very important, create a shared quality metrics that we are working on together with the language service providers right now. And actually, that we, it's, has been already demoed at certain places, and uh, we are now um, uh, finishing it and also building some software around it. And then the third one is extending existing platforms for resource sharing. The platform is called MetaShare. I just mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, to the need of quality MT research. And the last one is then really to define and prepare the larger research action. And um, so these are maybe the ones that are very important in, in this context here. The consortium is small right now for the preparatory project. It uh, involves the CNGL, um, uh, I think Josef is also here. No, he, I saw him earlier. Josef von Genabit, uh, ILSP Athena with uh, um, Stelios Piperides, uh, who I already mentioned, and University of Sheffield with Lucia Spezia, who cannot be here today. And as a subcontractor, we have the Globalization and Localization Industry Association with many, many companies that are really helping us to do this. So, and there's, if you look at the planning panel, I don't have to see much more, to say much more because many of you know these people, so it's more or less many of the names in European translation technology are behind it and participating in this initiative. And so the important trend that I want to finish off with is semantic space translation. In 49 already, Warren Weaver said, thus it may be true that the way to translate from Chinese to Arabic or from Russian to Portuguese is not to attempt the direct route, shouting from tower to tower, Perhaps the way is to descend from each language down to the common base of human communication, the real but as yet undiscovered universal language, and then re-emerge by whatever particular route is convenient. And Kevin Knight now says, as long as we get the who did what to who wrong, I'm, we are optimizing with respect to the wrong metric, and he was referring to blue. So 
now, right now, in statistical machine translation, yeah, it has been adopted the view that we have to go in many circles deeper into semantics, but how do you do this? And this could be now yeah, another talk relating to many of you who are working on the semantic web. Because if you look at the massive amount of semantic knowledge building up on the web right now, linked open data, PropNet, BabelNet, WordNet, thousand others of ontologies and shared linked data, we are coming to the point where we see the first glimpse of having some semantics not the full interlingua, but stuff that can be used for semantically enriched uh, machine translation. Moving closer to quality. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much.